Hello, Kingdom Builders. Scott and Krista Fletcher here with Reach International Ministries. We're enabling Asian nationals to reach East Asia for Christ is our calling. We want to thank you for partnering with us in our four ongoing projects. Our church planning project, our leadership training project, our food relief project, and our Kids of Destiny project. Now, just this year with our church planning project, we held a beach baptism with 57 new believers in Cambodia. We gathered them all together to see them make a public decision for their new faith in Jesus Christ for the very first time. To date, we have planted over 108 village church plants in unreached areas of Asia. We want to thank you for helping and being a part of this. Also this year, with our Kids of Destiny Project, our children's ministers are passionate about reaching unengaged children in their surrounding unreached villages where they are impacting kids with the Word and the love of God every week. Through their outreaches, they have helped share and explain the gospel with over 3,000 kids. That's incredible. And we want to thank you because you have partnered with us and you have helped us to make this kingdom impact for eternity in Asian lives. God bless you and thank you, Kingdom Builders. All right, all right. Good morning, Victory Family Church. It is my pleasure and privilege to be with you. Those are at Newcastle and all the different campuses, Meadsville, we say welcome to you also. Um, We just want to say thank you so much. You know, um, just to give a little bit of history real quick, um, you know, Victory is where we launched out to go to the mission field back in the year 2000. It was back on Freedom Road. And if you don't know, I I am Pastor John's brother-in-law, so... Stretch your hand, pray for me. <laughs> I'm Michelle's brother, so no. We absolutely, John and Michelle was the ones who married us. They pastored us in that, that time. And we just, we are so thankful for covenant relationships. Not just family. How I many know there's, fam, you know how family, family, the dynamics is all okay. But when you have a spiritual, a spiritual connection, it's very important. Amen. And so we are so thankful for victory. And, and, and not only Pastor John and Michelle, but there were so many that still, still support us today that was from those days way back then. And you as a church with Kingdom Builders, you have done so much in helping us fulfill what we're called to do. And I can't say thanks enough to you for doing that. But I can share with you a little bit about what you are doing on the other side of the world. Touch your neighbor and say, you're, you're touching the other side of the world. Whether you realize it or not, you may not be going with me and eating fish heads and rice, but you are going to the other side of the world through your prayers, through your partnering, through your giving. You are touching lives. And that's what's so important. You know, um, a missionary's main scripture is Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel shall be preached in where? All the what? World. USA? Only the USA? No, the whole entire world as a witness to all nations, which is the word ethnos or ethnicities, people groups, as a witness, and then the end will come. How many know God's not done yet? I mean, some people, you look at the news, it's all doom and gloom, and you're thinking it's all over, but I'm here to tell you God is only starting to begin in these last days. And you and I get to be a part of that. Touch your neighbor and say, you're going to be a part of that. You are a part of that, even now. And so we are so thankful for you. You know, you saw our video, and we talked about there's four projects we have ongoing in our ministry. And I just want to give you a summary real quick. You know, we, you'll actually see pictures of our projects, and you'll see people. And some of them, their, their faces are blurred or their eyes are, are, are blanked out. That's because of security reasons of some of the nations we work in. And, and we, I tell you, I am so privileged to rub shoulders with hidden heroes of the faith. You know, I had people walk up to me and say, oh, you, it's so wonderful, you being a missionary, giving up America and what you do. And I want to say, you know, you don't understand. It's those guys. It's those guys that risk their life. It's those guys that's been in jail. It's those guys that are doing amazing wonders for God. But you know what? 
you're helping us to help them be a part of that. And so, you know, our first project was our Timothy project. That's leadership training, 2 Timothy 2.2. We believe as Paul raised up Timothy to train leaders who would train leaders, it's the same principle, same principle in the kingdom of God. How many know we need strong leaders? How many know we need the right leaders? You can look at our nation. (laughs) You can look at nations. How many know it's pretty important who's in power and who's leading? I'm not here to get political. I'm here to just say this is principles from the Bible. Can you say amen? And we need the right people in leadership. And when we empower people with the right principles that are biblical and put them in leadership, then things begin to happen the way they should happen. And we see lives lifted instead of being pressed down. And that's what God wants. Can you say amen? And so we've been doing that in our leadership training. We call it our Timothy Project. And we've graduated with our leadership training. We've graduated people in in Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, which is Burma. Uh, We've even been into China. We've been a lot of places. But we've just been obedient to where God has told us to go and to do what he's told us to do. How many of you know that's all you can do? That's what you're supposed to do. Just be obedient. Amen? Our second one is our church planting project, and we, you saw a little bit of that. And we have planted to date 108 churches in villages that had no gospel witness. We started in the year 2018, and it was your pastor who came with me to uh, one of the nations that we train in. And, and it, he's the one that challenged and brought that out of me. I, God had been speaking to me, but I, I was kind of, you know, how many know sometimes it's hard to step out? How many know we need to be challenged? And we need good key people who will challenge us. We need those people in our life. And because of his challenge in me about what God had already spoken to me, today 108 churches are in villages that never had a gospel witness. And you've been a part of that. Can you say amen? And we have more churches coming. This this year, if we finish, we'll have 127 and maybe even more because our our pastors are working in even other villages. Our our third project is our food relief. And over COVID, that's where that came out of. There was an area between Thailand and Burma and Myanmar that they call them the trash people. They're these people from Burma that they have really no, no, they have nothing. They live on the trash heap. And in that area, these people were starving. And we sent pastors money, and this is our whole whole aim, is to give the resources to the pastors to put the packets together for them to take and then reach the people. Because then it gives credibility to the local pastor. And that's what we want. We don't want a big organization going in and remember the name of our organization. We want those pastors who are on the ground who will do the evangelizing and who will do the discipleship and follow up afterwards. And that empowers them to be successful. And, but then also in Laos and Burma, during that time, we had key pastors that we sent resources to. And they reached into families that were ap- actually opposed to the gospel. But because of their desperation, how many know what the devil meant for harm? How many has ever learned that? What he meant for harm, God twists it and turns it around and he makes it for something good. And he used that to open their hearts. And we had 128 families come to Christ who were before not open to the gospel. Amen. And you played a part of that. Touch your neighbor and say, wow, you've done a lot. (laughs) <laughs> Number four is the last one is our Kids of Destiny project, and that's when we were planting churches. And my coworker, we were in Cambodia, half of the village is kids, and he said we've got to do something for the kids. And I told him I'm busy in what I'm doing, and so he got a lady to write curriculum, and a one year, fifty two weeks of curriculum, and then we translated it into now we have it in Khmer, we have it in Thai, we have it in the Burmese, we have it in Vietnamese, we have it in Korean, we have other languages we're working on. And we took artwork and we, we, how many grew up and you saw the Italian Jesus and you saw the white guy with the tie and the woman with the dress, you know, and they're all Westerners. How many know you can't use that over there? Because if you use it over there, they think it's a Western religion. No, we said we want, when the kids see it, they understand Jesus is just like me. Jesus looks like me. Jesus talks like me. Jesus is personal to me. And when we did that, it it changed. And then 
I did like we did in our CP project. God told me to sponsor children ministers for 18 months like we did our church planners. And they started going into villages that were unreached with the kids. And today, they, we have seen over, actually to date, I asked my director there, over 4,500 kids have heard the gospel message that Jesus loves them. Can you say amen? Touch your neighbor and say, oh, you love kids. Amen. You've all been a part of that. And so we want to thank you as being kingdom builders all around the world. I know there's so many other ministries you support. But I am, I am just want to tell you today, I'm so thankful for this church. And I'm so thankful this is the church we left out of to the mission field. And we need to recognize our connections and what we have, our roots. How many know you need to be rooted down somewhere? You need to find a church that is a good church. This may not be the church, but if it is, you need to root yourself into it and grow from that. And when you grow from that, lives will be changed, not just your own. Can you say amen? I got a message I want to share with you today. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew 13. We're going to look at verse 44 to verse 46. The title of this message today is Pursuing Kingdom treasure. Pursuing kingdom treasure. Everyone say kingdom. <clears throat> How many likes treasure? Everybody likes treasure. <laughs> but what I'm referring to is God's love for humanity. Sometimes in our natural thinking, we relate treasure to material things. But God, how many of God sees different than man sees? And in this, these verses... When we read this, look with me. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all. Now notice this. He went and he sold what? All that he had and did what? Bought the field. In other words, there was a transaction there. He bought the field, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he finds one of great value, everyone say great value. When he finds one of great value, it says he went away, and notice this, he sold everything he had and bought it. And so I want us to to look at this and think about this scripture, and I'm going to give you three points and I want, really, my, my heart today is that the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, not just me. I don't want it to be a man. You know, any, I say anything that I say, just throw it away. But if it's from God, you better heed it. Amen? That's what God wants. And most ministers, their prayer is, God, let me not speak. Let you speak through me. And so the first point I want to talk to you about is this. Point number one, humanity is God's precious treasure. Humanity is the treasure that God deems the most expensive, most valuable, and that is what he wants. He loves mankind. You know, you hear so many people, well, you know, if God was such a loving God, he wouldn't let all these things happen. You know what? He didn't let them happen. He gave man free will and free choice, and the first man made the wrong choice. How many can't wait to get to heaven and say, Adam, why did you do that, Adam? He said, I listened to the woman. I won't say anything else right there. I'll just, no. <laughs> you know, I'm so thankful for my wife. I, how many know that I have a saying, but behind every good man is a better woman. And I'm very thankful for my woman who has empowered me on the mission field. How many know your, your family is important? People are important. And people are treasure. And that's the way God sees people. My first scripture in this point is this, Psalms chapter 8 and verse 4. When the writer of Psalms, he's talking out loud and he's talking about God and his creation. And notice what he says is, what is man that you are mindful of him? How many know that God thinks about us? There's so many. We live in a world and society, there is an enemy in our society. And he wants to blind us and deceive us so that we do not hear and we do not know what God is thinking and saying. 
But if you're here today, I pray that there's anything that's been in your life to deceive you and keep you from hearing the voice of God, that it be broken and that you begin to have ears to hear and know that God loves you and he's mindful of you. He's thinking about you and he has good plans and he has a purpose for your life. Can you say amen? It goes on to say, and the son of man that you visit him. Everyone say visit. This Hebrew word visit is pretty unique. It means to pay attention to and to be sought out for visitation or connection. That's pretty interesting. When God created mankind, he didn't just create him as another part of creation that he could just look at everything and say, look at all these things. He created man to be connected to him and to be one with him, to be his family, to be his children. To be the ones, and you know what, still today, even though man has fallen in our sinful condition, God is still seeking out how he can connect to humanity and love them and bless them and lift them beyond the place they're in today. Amen. That's the heart of God. He sees us as a treasure. In James chapter 5, in verse 7, we see that the Bible tells us, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. How many know Jesus is coming back pretty soon? How many of you got, we got any people here that's been studying the Bible and eschatology, and you see that the signs of the times are more clear than they've ever been before, and we see the aligning of nations and Israel and Russia and Iran, and we see all these things coming together, and we're, we're recognizing Jesus is about to come back. But the Bible tells us, be patient, be patient, be patient. And why are we being patient? It says, see how the farmer waits for what? Precious. Everyone say, my precious. <laughs> I know there's a movie that talks to everybody who knows The Hobbit. But you know what? God has a precious, and that's people. That's lives. He has precious, a precious treasure. And his heart is going out for those who do not know him. Now, I tell this story in 2003. I went with a group of, of a few Americans and Taiwanese, and we went into mainland China, and we went to evangelize. And we had to be very careful there. You don't want to get arrested. Actually, the day after this, we did get arrested. We spent time in the jail all day long until they let us go. But the day before, we went into this area in this village and we were outside of Shanghai in the Yangtze River. And we went into this village where the people, they just have dirt floors. And, and I remember going in with my translator. And we met this, this daughter and his, her elderly father. And he was probably in his latter 70s or early 80s. And I began sharing just the simple message of the love of God and how all men have sinned. But yet Jesus came to give his life for us to pay what we could not pay. And as I began telling this... Tears start swelling up in this, this older man's eyes, and actually one tear falls from his left eye, and I'm like, this is it, this is it. It's time to then close the deal and have him pray and receive Jesus. And when I began to do that, as I began to ask him to pray, he wiped his eyes and he stood up and he said, no. And he began to say in Chinese, he was just saying, how is it? How is it for 70 years, all my life, I have gone without ever hearing the story you just told me? And so, yes, yeah, something you spoke in here did something, but my mind tells me that this is not true, and I am not going to pray this prayer, and he left. I don't know what happened to that man to this day. One thing we did, we left a track with his daughter that gives the prayer of salvation that he could pray out loud. We don't know if he got saved or not. But I left and went back to Taiwan, and God began convicting me and showing me that there are there is actually two-thirds of the world without Christ, and many of that two-thirds of the world without Christ have yet to hear the simple message and the gospel of Jesus Christ for the very first time. How many know that should not be? That should not be as a church living on the world on the earth today, as people in the body of Christ. That should not be. Can you say amen? God loves the world. And he wants the world to hear the message. My second point is this. The cost to pay for that treasure of humanity has been paid already. 
The cost has been paid. Who was it paid by? It was paid by Jesus, the son of the living God. In John 3, 16, everyone knows that. For God so loved the what? How many of you know it doesn't say God so loved America? I want to challenge you here today. I mean, I've lived outside of the United States for 24, going on 25 years. And I'm here just to tell you that we can get caught up in American religion. We can get up, caught up in just thinking about, you know, Americans, we're guilty because we always put ourselves first. We put our needs first. We put what, what I'm entitled to and what is my rights and this is what should be and I should have this and I should have that. And how many know God is greater than just America and just your needs? Yeah, he loves you and he wants to meet your needs, but it's bigger than you. There is a world that has yet to hear about him. And I don't say that to put condemnation on you. I say that to challenge you and to inspire you and to build you up that your life has a purpose. Can you say amen? And God is seeking those he can use. But one of the things he wants us to know is, is that he gave his son already. And Jesus already paid the price. In Isaiah chapter 53, we look at verse 4 to 6, and we hear about the price that God the Father paid by giving his son and how his son suffered a gruesome, awful uh, death that mutilated his body, suffered in his soul, and his spirit was broken. Why? So that he could pay the price for you and me. With none of us, none of us are able wash or remove or get rid of our sin. You can pray, you can do penance, you can go through, jump through hoops, you can be a Hindu, you can be a Muslim, I don't care who you are. There's all kind of rules and regulations and we all have brought, broken those rules and regulations and no one has been perfect. But there was one who walked the earth and he was perfect. He became a man born of a virgin And when he came to the 33rd year of his life, he gave his life willingly. And the Bible tells us that we esteem him and understand that he was stricken. He was smitten by God. He was afflicted by God. Why? Because he loved us. Because he paid the price. He gave the cost. The Bible tells us he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Can you say amen? It goes on to tell us as we read more how the Lord laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. I'm telling you on that day when he went to the cross, all of humanity, every guilt, every, every power of, uh, every choice of sin, everything that we've done that was wrong throughout humanity from Adam to the last man in history was placed upon Jesus. And at that moment, he took upon him the sin of the world, and he paid the cost for you and I. Can you say amen? Can you raise your hands and say, thank you, Lord? Can you say, Jesus, I am so thankful that you gave it all for me. Oh, what a price he paid. You know, when we think about this, we understand God paid the highest cost ever paid a transaction through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for each and for all who would find him. God is not hiding from you here today. If you're in this place and you don't know him, he's not, he's not somewhere who's a mysterious God. He's wanting to reach out to you and make known to you that you don't have to leave this place in shame. You don't have to leave this place in depression or oppression. You don't have to leave this place the same. He can give you a brand new life, and it was paid by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And that brings me to my last point, and that is this. Now we must understand our cost 
for obeying the commission of Christ. How many know before Jesus left, he delegated a commission to us? I like what one preacher said, it's not the great suggestion, it's the great commission. Two things. Go and tell what I've done. Go and preach about the, this good news. Evangelize. And the second thing is go into all the nations and teach them what I have taught you. And baptize them in my name. And now we have this cost that we have. How many know in a covenant, it's two parties. And when one gives all that they are, it requires the other party to give all that they are. Can you say amen? And so Jesus has given everything for us. But now all he asks is that we return everything that we have for him. And there is a cost. In Mark chapter 8 and in verse 34, the Bible tells us this. When he had called the people to himself... With his disciples also, he said to them, whosoever desires to come after me, notice this, let him speak about his entitlement. Is that what the Bible says? Let him talk about what rights they should have. No? Is that what your Bible says? Maybe I got the wrong Bible. No. The Bible tells us. Whosoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Touch your neighbor and say, you have a cross. You know, I rub shoulders with some amazing guys on the other side of the world. And they are hidden heroes. And the cost that they pay to obey God, you would not even begin to understand and fathom. You know, sometimes I tell, I'm talking to my, to Pastor John and, and Michelle, and I, I'm explaining, and, and to me it's just common because I'm around it all the time. But they're like, oh my gosh, you know, that, that's crazy. And, and so, but I've been around it all these, but let me tell you, let me talk about Pastor Somchai. He's one of our leaders that is in Laos. He was one that committed to be a church planner. And Pastor Somchai, he had it so strong in his heart to plant churches during COVID when that season was there. And we were doing our third church planting project. He went into four unreached villages in Laos. Now, let me explain something. Laos is a very, very communistic nation. It is very persecuted. Christians go missing. Some of them have actually been murdered and you don't find their remains. That's how bad it is. If you want to look up, you can actually Google some of it. You can see some of it. The Voice of Martyrs, they'll tell you some of these stories. And so he went into four villages. He's risking his life now. Understand this. He went into four villages, connected with families in all four of those villages, and won people to Christ. But in one of those villages, there was a village chief that got upset with what Pastor Somchai was doing. Now, how many know Somchai is not his real name? I'm just using that. They got upset with what he was doing, and they reported him to the authorities. Now, during COVID, the authorities were too afraid to come because they were afraid of COVID. But when COVID settled down, guess what? The authorities came, and they began putting a report and and writing up what Pastor Somchai had done. And then they showed up at his front door, and they handcuffed Pastor Somchai and took him to jail. And not only that, there was a new governor over that province, and he decided, I'm going to make a show of it and flex my muscles as a new governor and show my power. He took him from the local jail and put him in the provincial prison and even put him in isolation. And they kept him for three months. And this is not American prisons and jails. There's no AC. There's no cable. There's no education you can do and get your college courses. This is a real jail that you don't want to go to. And there is Pastor Somchai, and I'm talking with my director, Pastor David, and I'm telling him, you know, he told me, he said, Pastor Somchai has got released, and now he's back at his home. And I said, good, how's he doing? And he said, Brother Scott, you won't understand what he's doing. And I was like, what? Is he he laying low? You know, he needs to to calm down. He needs to to let things settle down. He said, no, no, he's refusing to stay at his home. He's going back to the four villages. 
And I was like, no, don't do that, Pastor Somchai. And he said, how can I stay when I want these people to Jesus? They're new believers, and if I don't go, they will denounce their faith in Christ. He said, I got to go back. And Pastor Somchai went back. Now, he didn't get arrested this time, but they came and they took away his passport and his government ID, and he can't travel out of the province. This is a man who paid the price and counted the cost. Why? He found a treasure. He found God's treasure. There's another man, a young man. I call him Pastor Philip. That's not his real name. He's in Myanmar, in Burma. He went to a certain city in Myanmar, and that's where we sponsored him to plant his church. He began reaching out to young people and college students, and then he, he reached out to the elderly through food distribution. And he, he's, he was doing an amazing job. But you know, how many of you know, when, then came January of 2021, and somebody got inaugurated. I, I won't say his name or who he was, but he was a leader of this nation. And when he got inaugurated, when, when they put him in, into power, the day after, the military of Burma threw a coup and overthrew the government. And all of a sudden, you saw a massed group of young people protesting, saying, no, we want our government back. We don't want the military anymore because it had already been like that in Burma. And guess what? The military started cracking down and started killing young people. They went and burnt houses where Pastor Peter... A pastor of Philip lives. They burnt down houses in his neighborhood and they started killing some of his neighbors who were doing the protesting. He was smart not to go protesting. But get this, he told me, he said, they were shooting and bullets hit my front door and my front wall. And now this, this is pastor. He's got two young boys and his wife. And we told him, we said, you've got to come back to the Thai-Burma border. Get out of there. You know what he told us? He said, how can, I, how can I leave? How can I pack my bags and go and leave these people I've won to Jesus? He said, if Jesus gave his life for them, I have to stay for them. And we actually pleaded with him, you could die. And he said, I don't care. Me and my wife has made a decision. We are staying. How many know that is paying the cost for the Great Commission? That is paying the price to find God's eternal treasure. God loves the world. And the world is bigger than America. The world is bigger than what we see. But you know what? God comes right down to where you are right today. And he speaks something to you. He says, I see your life. I am not withholding mine, and I'm willing to give all that I am to you. But he's asking now us as a church. We are the ecclesia in the earth today. How many of you believe, how many understand God is not done with the American church? I'm telling you. God is not finished with this nation. There is a call upon this nation. God rose up this nation just like a spiritual Israel. And the rest of the world has been influenced with the gospel because of this nation. And I believe he's only just begun. Tell your neighbor, tap your neighbor. Say, God has just begun in this last day church. And God is working. I want us all to stand up. Let's all stand up right now. I want to I ask you to do something today. I want you to close your eyes right where you're at. Here's the truth. The eternity of many souls weigh in the balance of the church and individual's obedience to count the cost to respond to his commission. I'll say that again. I want you to just close your eyes and listen to this. The eternity, the eternity of many souls weigh in the balance of a church and an individual's decision and obedience to count the cost to obey the commission of Christ. And I believe that here today before me is a great church, a great body, but right now as we're standing here, you, you close your eyes, and, and I don't want you thinking about other things. I, I just want you to take a moment. Just take one moment 
and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God never calls us to do something we cannot do. He always empowers us. And you may be in this place here today, and your Christianity has been just a passive Christianity. It hasn't been a serious walk with God. And there may be even things that you know God is calling you to serve and to do things, to be in leadership, to make choices, to get plugged into the church, maybe this church, maybe another church. I don't care where it is. But God has been speaking to you. And he simply asks us this, if I gave my son and I paid the full cost for redeeming you, can you not pay the cost of obeying what I've called you to do? And by obeying that, guess what? You are opening the door to affect a destiny of other people. Right now, under my voice, you are here today and you say, Brother Scott, I want to make a decision today to step up, to change, and say, I am going to count the cost, and I am going to listen to the Holy Spirit, and I am going to respond to God. Just before you and God, no one looking around, I want you to put your hand up, and you can put it back down. Amen, 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 amen. Yes, there's hands going up all over this place. Choosing, choosing what God chooses over your own choice. But I also want to speak to another group here today. No one looking around. You're here today and you say, Brother Scott, I don't understand all this church thing. I don't, I don't really understand Christianity. But one thing I know is I got sin in my life. I got problems in my life. I've got shame in my life. I've got oppression and depression in my life. I, I, my life is messed up. And I don't know where to go. And you're talking about this man, God, Jesus. Jesus who paid the price for me. And, 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 and he forgives my sins. And today, as I'm standing here, I want to choose this Jesus just like he chose to die for me. I'm here today, and I want to say yes to new life. I'm tired of the life I'm living. I want my sins to be removed. I want my shame to go. I want this Jesus in my life. And if that's you here today, no one looking around. This is only between you and God. If that is you, I want you to raise your hand and acknowledge to him. Yes. 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 You can put your hand back down after you raise it. If that's you and you're saying, yes, I want to receive he who paid the greatest cost. That is me. Anyone else? Anyone else? Because this is the most important decision you could ever make for your life. If that's you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want us all to do something. I want us all to pray out loud, to pray with those that raise their hand. We're going to pray in agreement. Pray this prayer with me and say, Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving Jesus for me. Thank you for giving life when I have none right now. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I turn away from my old life. And I receive the life of Jesus. Jesus, come into my heart. I thank you that I am born anew. And I acknowledge that you are in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you made that decision here today, that is the greatest decision you could ever make. Everybody, let's clap our hands. Let's celebrate with those who receive Christ. Glory to what God.